Hey Magic fans, I'm Joe. Thanks very much for joining me today. If you'd like to support my channel, please take a second and check out the link above to my Patreon page. I'm here with the 8th Q that I've played so far uh, with this 4-color uh, Soul Herder deck. I'm on the play, and this hand is lovely. Uh, so really, the um, things you're looking for with these, with these opening hands is 2 lands and a 2-drop. Uh, of course, if you've got two lands, a two drop, and Oko, that's pretty awesome. Uh, also looking like uh, another great hand would be two lands, uh, Hierarch, and Oko, because turn two Oko is like one of the best things the deck can do. Uh, but anyhow, sort of um, baseline, entry-level, keepable opening hands is, is, is two lands that can cast a two drop. And yeah, this meets that, and then we've got a bunch of other gas, so... Go ahead and play the windswept teeth and pass. Opponent kept seven, and here's a well, a forest into noble hierarch. So all I know, it could be another soul herder deck. Probably not though. Okay, well, charming prince is an interesting option. I think uh, since we want lands, let's go ahead and and dig a little deeper than Ice Fang Kawaddle could do. So here, I'm gonna bottom the oracle and keep uh, the tomb on top. Ah, uh, so all right, this is Infect, and we don't have black mana. Uh, well, we have the Overgrown Tomb, we don't have any removal. Uh, Oko could potentially turn their um, Infectors into Elks, but it's, it can't hit Ink Moth because it's at uh, sorcery speed. Opponent just passing through here. There's the Tomb. Uh, we do get to just sort of slam Oko here, make some, uh, make some food, I guess. I'll get in with the Charming Prince, see what the opponent wants to do. And uh, I guess I wanted to turn the Hierarch into um, a 3-3, take them off of blue mana if possible, and extra green mana so that they can't uh, play a bunch of pump spells. Uh, but they had the Blossoming Defense, so that's going to counter uh, the Elkification. Okay, another Blink Moth. Uh, they can use the second, or Ink Moth. Oh man. Scale up. So it's a 6-4 now, and yeah, it's a 10-8. Uh, so sometimes you lose on turn 3. Uh, this is, our, our deck is not a deck that can win on uh, turn 3, but we have lots and lots of ways to interact with these kinds of decks. Oko being one of them, but unfortunately the opponent just had the, uh, the draw that just dodges all of our sorcery speed stuff, and we didn't draw our path or our... Assassin's Trophy, anything like that. Against uh, Ink Moths, we're going to want to bring in Force of Vigor. That's pretty good. Um, so let's go ahead to the sideboard. Sorry, to the second match, and I guess we can check the sideboard, see what we did against Infect. I really am unprepared for Infect right now. My sideboard is just garbage. I need to fix it. So let's check it out. All right, back for game two against Infect. Let's take a quick peek at the sideboard, see if I can remember any decisions that I made. Trimmed, one Prince, one Soul Herder, one Siege Rhino, um, one Eternal Witness. That's four cards trimmed. And then I would have brought in, um, I mentioned Force of Vigor. Um, man, what else is in this sideboard? I don't even know right now. Uh, oh, I guess I have two Winds of Abandon. That's pretty solid. Uh, and then something else, which we'll probably figure out along the way. Oh, once a fairy. It's just insane against Infect. So um, this is a, <laughs> almost a home run opening hand. Uh, we just need to hope to draw into um, a second source that can cast these cards. So I kept. A little sketchy, but, you know, I kept. Not going to crack this Vista. Going to try to draw lands. Okay, we do like to see Hierarch instead of, like, Glistener Elf. Ugh, that's rough. One more chance to draw lands before we start suffering. Listener Elf. Oh, okay. Thank God. Uh, so I think the play here is just um, Coiling Oracle and hold up Ephemerate and hopefully just um, establish some blockers and then get to Fairy down because we can't just afford to just lose to Fairy right away. And if I bounce the Glistener Elf, for example, they can just uh, attack with Noble Hierarch. So 
Here they're going to get in with the Glistener Elf. I'm going to throw the Coiling Oracle in front of it and then try to Ephemerate. So it looks like the opponent has a response, and they go for Vines, which is kind of a weird play, right? But what this actually says, it doesn't really do Hexproof. It it, all it cares about is that a creature can't be the target of spells or abilities that, that I control, that the Infect player's opponents controls. So it's basically giving it Hexproof from my stuff, um, or protection from my stuff. So I kind of wanted this to resolve, So I'm, and I've got a bunch of stuff that I can just pitch, so... I'm going to pitch one of these Coiling Oracles and try to counter that. Opponent had another uh, Vines, though, which is funky because it's a lot of cards to throw away to deal with one Coiling Oracle, which was already going to, well, I guess it wasn't going to die, but it's going to keep me off of card draw. So, decent play by the opponent. Um, <laughs> so, Oko is nice. I'll play that guy. Make some food and, uh, well, actually, I'm sorry. I spoke too fast. Of course, I'm just going to turn the Infector into, uh, into a 3-3. So, you know, we can't go um, too crazy just turning things into 3-3s here and there, uh, left and right, because they have a lot of pump spells, and eventually they can just sort of hit our life total. One is another Glistener Elf. Uh, Groundswell without Landfall, but it's enough to take the Oko down, so... That kind of unfortunate. Uh, we can just go ahead and play uh, an Oracle again. Eternal Witness, decent draw, but we don't have two green. Hoping that the Ephemerate will stick this time. Okay, getting in with just the Infector. I'm going to do the same play where I try to Ghost Block with the Oracle. Okay, fortunately that one resolved. Force of Vigor, not really doing a lot here. They don't have the uh, Ink Moth draw this game. Okay, once upon a time, draws a Blighted Agent. It's decent. All right, we'll rebound, draw another card with Oracle. Hits a Prismatic Vista, and then another land. Just a pretty nice combo there because I can play Teferi now and play out a second blocker. I think I might have made this Planeswalker mistake here. Did I not tick to ferry up? Okay, I did. Oof. That's something I need to get better at. Is The first thing I need to do on turns with Planeswalkers most of the time is just activate the Planeswalker so I don't forget. All right, and then I'm just going to pass because I've got instant speed Kowattl that the opponent can't interact with. So if they want to buff one of their creatures, they have to do it during their main phase. So here's uh, Old Krosa making it a 5 5. And now they're going to get in at Teferi with both creatures. I had to, I'm definitely going to block the Infector with the Coatl. I had to think a little bit about whether I wanted to block the, um, the other one as well. Could depend on what I draw off the Coatl. Force is kind of a weird one. If I decided to, to just protect Teferi here, uh, Infector down. I know that the Blighted Agent is coming, uh, but we can at the very least, um, well, we can go back and get an Oko out of the graveyard with Eternal Witness, or just get back an Ephemerate and get a loop going. But we have still taken no um, poison yet. Okay, we just drew another Oko, which is, which is really beautiful because you play it, you turn the Infector into an Elk, And yeah, um, I guess Teferi can tick up, so it's going to be hard for them to uh, kill both of our Planeswalkers, unless they have a bunch of pump spells. But I'm kind of at a life total where the opponent could just, uh, just, just deal with me that way. Okay, this is a little bit scary. Uh, so changing this into a 6-4, which means that he's got 13 power... Uh, which is pretty rough, I guess. You know, like I was saying earlier, you you can't just go nuts turning these things into 3-3s three because the, the pump spells are going to make them like 7-7s, seven you know, and, and they can just kill you that way. So, all right. I was sort of resigned to just uh, losing here, but the opponent attacked my Planeswalkers. <laughs> I got 13. 
I guess uh, infect players don't look at your life total that much. Um, maybe they thought I was going to play a path or something and they could at least get rid of Oko if they attack both of them into him. But still a more experienced player, I think. They realize they're a little bit behind with these two Planeswalkers on the, on the, on the battlefield. Just I have three cards in hand. Just go for my face. Game over. Instead, Oko down, just totally buying me, like, Oko just ate two pump spells there, and an entire turn, basically. All right, so now, start opening things up a little bit. Teferi is down, so Ephemerate is amazing. It's just like a constant ghost block every single turn. And there's two in the graveyard, so I can just uh, Ephemerate, you know, right now, get the other Ephemerate, or Ephemerate whenever I want and get back the other Ephemerate. Opponents only got these non-infect creatures. Okay, once upon a time. We already saw the Blighted Agent. Now, uh, Inkpoth Nexus, we have that covered with Force of Vigor, which is pretty cool. Okay, they chose to cycle the Waterlog Grove. Both at Teferi. Um, so that, I think that we are going to block and Ephemerate, obviously. And Teferi can take three for now. Go get Coiling Oracle for now. It won't be able to block right now because blocks have already been declared. But I'll have more blockers moving forward. And as I mentioned, I'll be able to get two Ephemerates back pretty soon. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, target the Eternal Witness, get back Ephemerate. This is what you should always do. Uh, hierarchs seem good. They're more blockers. Take it to ferry up. Play both Hierarchs. Um, the opponent forgot to play their Ink Moth. Uh, if they um, did play it, I would have, of course, uh, left up mana for Force of Vigor. But as it stands, if it was really necessary, I could still ephemerate, get back a green spell, and pitch it to cast Force of Vigor. So uh, I can swing here, since we've got just basically double blocks and double ephemerate here. So they finally play that Ink Moth Nexus. I can't imagine they'll do anything except attack Teferi here. Um, Teferi, Teferi. We are going to block block. Ephemerate, grab the other Ephemerate. Target uh, Hierarch, so no damage through, no creatures dead. Uh, we're going to target Witness, get back one Ephemerate. Target the other Witness, get back the other Ephemerate. So now we have two Ghost Blocks and, and, uh, and basically extra cards coming from the graveyard every single turn for the rest of the game. I definitely think I'm going up to two Teferis. Um, it's really good in a lot of matchups, like two in the sideboard, I think. So opponent realizes that, you know, they can't really do anything here. I think they know that I have the Force of Vigor from, a, like, an early Coiling Oracle. So we get to get some value. Um, get back a land. And get back a Force. Then, of course, get the Ephemerates back. Uh, Charming Prince. Uh, I think we're going to cast Winds of Abandon here. Wipe their board. They're still at 15 life. It's going to take a few attacks to get there. We still have two Hierarchs up to cast the Ephemerates. Um, this is a situation where um, if they attack and go big with uh, Ink Moth, I can, of course, just uh, Ephemerate, get a green spell, pitch it to Force of Vigor. Okay, so here they're going to try to go for basically Hexproof on this guy. But they cannot do anything at instant speed. So this is all frozen in time. I'm going to go grab a Coiling Oracle, pitch it to Force of Vigor, blow up the uh, Ink Moth Nexus, and there's literally just zero they can do about it because Teferi. All right, so I just blinked a Coiling Oracle here. Um, I'm still going to get back the Ephemerates. At a certain point, it starts to take time off the clock that you can't really afford to lose when you feel like the opponent is just beaten. Uh... I know one of these turns I forgot to tick to ferry up. Okay, Prince gonna bounce what? Coiling Oracle. Giver of Runes. Um what? I think I'm gonna get back Oko now and just turn that into an elk. At this point, there's just so many game actions that I need to take that I can I can begin to sort of time out. So Oko down, Giver of Runes is an elk. Keep swinging for three in the air. And I'm gonna have to discard. Mountain of Value. Okay, get back the Ephemerate. Swing for three. Okay, tick up. 
pitch a force unnecessary. And uh, yeah, I've just got lethal. So hustle to the um, hustle to combat, and uh, yeah, that was game two, and we both are like down to around seven minutes. Uh, it can be tricky to win uh, with this deck in in seven minutes, but it can be done. Uh, so definitely gonna have to play fast in game three. Currently one one. Uh, very fortunate to have sort of uh, stolen that game off of Infect because, as I mentioned, the sideboard is not really as prepared as it could be for them. Um, but we drew our Teferi and it and it took us to the Promised Land. So thank you, Teferi. On to game three. All right, back for game three of match eight with all these cues trying out testing uh, four color Soul Herder. And uh, yeah, this is keepable. It meets that uh, that baseline I was talking about with uh, castable two drops. Opponent mulls to five, but we know Infect can have pretty powerful mulls to five. <laughs> Giver of runes. That card uh, can be really annoying, actually. Another force is pretty awkward. Uh, all right, so they have an Infector with protection from Giver and a second Infector. Citrano's <laughs> nice, I guess, as a closer, but uh, you know we're on defense for now because five attacks with these guys and it's just lights out. Plus, you know their deck is full of pump spells. So, hey, okay, Sanctum, Groundswell. So I'm gonna counter that. I pitch Soul Herder, and I guess maybe they're holding up like vines to counter removal or something, but I'm not sure why they wouldn't attack with the Ink Moth here. So I guess it's, I, you know, um, I don't know if there's like a super optimal timing for Giver. Like if they let me block, then they give protection, I'm just going to lose the Ice Fang. But I chose not to um, block there. They're on one card. I, I doubted it was another another pump spell, the way this guy has been playing. And also, just based on math, like I didn't think they had some, some nutty card there. And um, I didn't really want to lose my Ice Fang, particularly when we have the Ephemerate here. So I can play an untapped Breeding Pool just because we don't really care about our life total. We can try to block and um, ephemerate, but it's not really likely to happen because they're probably going to give... Well, let's see how it goes. They can only give one creature protection. All right, so we do have, we do have the colors up for this. So just going to hard cast Force of Negation. And now, you know, they give it... Um, the opponent went below five minutes first. Pro blue, but it's still just a 1-1. One, one. So the forces actually came in clutch here. Because they had sort of a pump spell heavy hand. Right? So I guess the play now is to get our big threat down and you know try to actually battle a little bit. The life gain is not really significant, but but hitting the opponent's life total is. Uh, we have a nice attack next turn set up and then an ephemerate. Okay. I was kind of hoping the opponent would cycle their waterlogged grove rather than activate both Inkpoth Nexus, Nexuses, Nexi. And they did. Uh, so Might of Old Crow, so we can't do anything about that. Um, they do give it protection from green. Both of our creatures are green. And they still are not activating this Inkpoth Nexus. It's kind of... Um, I guess if... I guess if they swung with it, I could have I could have just traded with it, which is maybe the reason to not do that. All right, Oracle and Ice Fang Quaddle. These are decent draws. I'm going to go ahead and crack in with Siege Rhino. Opponent's going to go down to 11. Got pretty nice mana here now. I'm play the Oracle. Um, hit a land. Not great, but at least it put it straight onto the battlefield. Okay, so Blighted Agent. Things are... Reaching a boil here. We are both around four minutes. I have seven infect already. They can okay. They have no more 
<laughs> tap their mana really funny, but I guess they're on zero cards, so it doesn't matter. They have two attackers if they want it right now. Um, but they can only give protection to one of them. All right, so they give protection from green, and this is just another one infect. But I go up to eight, which means they're going to have multiple evasive ink moths next next turn and, and infectors they're going to have blighted agent and two ink moths and i'm going to have to be able to stop two of that so here's the ice fang it's not going to be able to block obviously assassin's trophy was an awesome draw um it might help me get through this because double flyers means i should be able to block let's see well it could definitely if they don't get protection to this guy i can just block with a ground creature if they give protection to a flyer, I can just kill whatever they give protection to, I guess, in response with Assassin's Trophy. All right, so let's ephemerate the Siege Rhino. Opponent goes down to eight. Now, hmm. I wasn't actually sure this was optimal here. I guess, I guess so, right? Like, when I did this... Um, I forgot for a second that it was going to give the Siege Rhino Summoning Sickness. Like, if I just target, like, a Coiling Oracle, then I can swing for four, five, six. Still not lethal, so... Yeah, I think that, I think that this is probably correct. Okay, drawing a land, pretty terrible, but I already got the Assassin's Trophy. Let's see what the opponent has. All right, activate and... Activate. So let's see. We've got two flyers for their two flyers. We've got a ground creature for their ground creature. And just this blighted agent can slip through here. Um, yeah, and the assassin's trophy is up. So I'm going to go ahead and hit that guy. They get a forest, which is scary because now they can give the blighted agent like some buffs. Um, if they have the one card in hand is a pump spell. Um, but yeah, the, the Blighted Agent is currently the only one that can fit uh, slip through. The opponent knows that I've got this, this big fatty attacking next turn. Um, and at this point, they can't even... They don't have the mana to reactivate both Ink Moths and block. Like block, block, block. Take four. That's how you live here. The opponent thought about his attacks. Ultimately just got in with Blighted Agent. I can't block that. I'm going to go ahead and thin my deck, crack my lands. And unless they have something amazing here, I think they're just dead on board. So uh, let's go to our draw step. Now, Soul Herder is, is pretty fun. Um, I don't think I'm going to get to play it, but um, it would have gotten another uh, Lightning Helix out of the Siege Rhino. So if I crack in like this, what's, what's some combination that the opponent could have? Um, like, Beast Within would take my Siege Rhino out of combat. That would be pretty good. Um, then they would take three. And, uh, yeah, Siege Rhino would be gone. I guess at that point I would need to Soul Herder Blink and draw something amazing. But I don't think that they play Siege, uh, Beast Within. More likely is something like Path with White Mana that they play to get Giver of Runes down. Or maybe, like, Dismember, but they don't really have the life total to work with. So opponent activates an Ink Moth, thinks a little bit, and then yeah, they just scoop. Uh, so eight matches up, eight matches down. Uh, again, they're they're Magic Online cues, so not the best opponents, but you know they're they're pretty good. They're like F and M level, I'd say. Uh, everybody makes mistakes, some more than others, some fewer than others. Uh, this opponent in particular, this guy Bounds, um, was super nice after the match. He um, like, congratulated me on playing so well and uh, said it was a great match, like, amazing magic, and I thought it was a lot of fun, too. I just expected to get crushed after game one, but Teferi just held it down in game two. And then, yes, yeah, Siege Rhino got there in game three. Um, of all things, a four drop against Infect, but crazier things have happened. All right, guys, so thanks for joining me today uh, and sort of watching some of my testing with this four-color Soul Herder build. 
Uh, I, I'm not necessarily thinking that it's like just the bomb because I won eight matches in a row. You know, those kinds of streaks happen all the time. Uh, but I'm definitely uh, feeling pretty good about it. Actually, the mana feels a little better than I thought it was going to once I made the tweak to run more basic forests just to make sure I don't get screwed so much in my opening hands with like basic islands and basic basic planes especially. Uh, and the Assassin's Trophies were, were really clutch. Um, they, they helped me win this game. Uh, what else? Oko, just constant overperformer. Uh, interested very much in hearing your guys' thoughts down below. Um, both sort of your thoughts on, on how this match went, how all of these matches have gone on these replays, but also like your own experience. H have any of you guys been playing any variety of Soul Herder like Bant or Four Colors? Some people are playing Collected Company uh, with really good results. Uh, there have been a bunch of 5-0s with Collected Company and Soul Herder. Uh, so yeah, I'm just going to sign off. That's, it's, been a, it's been a long afternoon uh, doing these replays. I hope you guys enjoy it. So please share your comments. Please subscribe if you haven't done that. And if you'd like to support this content, please take a moment and pledge over at my Patreon page. Uh, and keep tuning in. I'll be back, I'm sure, with, with more gameplay soon. I'll see you guys then. Bye.